Jackson. Thank you. I mentioned Jack Spong because, in a sense, Jack Spong is where the public start with yeah. the sorts of things that you're interested in. That is, who was Jesus as an historical figure and what does it mean for us today? What grabbed you that made you say, this is important, or that 25, 30 years ago? What really grabbed me was 1960, I was at the Passion Play in Oberammergau. And 1960 was the second time since the, the war. Obviously, they were otherwise occupied in Bavaria in 1940. So 1950, 1960 were the second ones after the war. I mean, I didn't know the story. <laughs> I knew how it ended. But what struck me when I saw it for the first time as a play, as a drama on the stage, was that this was a weird story. Nobody has explained to me how it begins, of course, on Palm Sunday, as we call it, 9 o'clock in the morning, the whole stage is filled with people all shouting for Jesus. Way, ray Jesus. Then 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, on what we call Good Friday, everyone's against Jesus, and it's the same people on the stage. Now, it had never occurred to me before, but this is strange. This is a bad story. I mean, I really said it's a weird story. It, nobody has explained to me why the crowd shifted. How does so, it fit chronologically and psychologically? Yeah. Now, when I read the story in the, in the, in the New Testament, I, I just went right over that. I mean, whatever. But when you look at it as a drama and you watch it in the stage and you see the subversion, you say, what? There's something missing here. There's something I'm mm. not being told. So it really started my interest in the historical Jesus and in the whole problem, actually, of anti-Semitism and everything else. There's something else here that interests me too, in that you grew up as a young, earnest Catholic in Ireland. Right. And at some point you mentioned that during your training and your scholarship, you discovered the Bible. Yeah. As if it was in some ways at that point had been separate to your faith. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up as a Roman Catholic in Ireland, and Roman Catholicism was like the wallpaper. You weren't aware, I'm a Roman Catholic. I mean, as distinct from what? It's like being Irish as distinct from what? So I took it all for granted. I heard all of these stories, but I never read them in the Bible. We learned them through the rosary, through the Stations of the Cross, through the liturgy. I was an altar boy at the age of eight. I knew all about the missile and how to carry it, not drop it and disgrace yourself. But I can't even remember when I first saw a Bible, uh, literally a Bible. I went into the monastery. We spent four hours a day in Gregorian chant, in the, the Psalms and readings from the Bible, but I never read the Bible. It all came through the liturgy, which had won, of course, tremendous advantage. I knew it, but nobody kept telling me, now, this must be taken literally. When you're praying it in the liturgy, nobody stops to say, now, first station of the cross, that happened. Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. Well, that didn't happen. Nobody parsed the thing like that. So I didn't grow up attacking or accepting a sort of a fundamentalist vision. I just... Understood. So, so w when you first encountered the Bible as a document, that must have sort of resonated with you in some way. It, it did, but it was very ambiguous. I, had, I went to a boarding school. Uh, from, when I was 11, I went to a boarding school, St. Eunice in Letterkenny in Donegal. It was a classical boarding school. I had five years of Greek and five years of, of uh, Latin. So my first experience when I went into the monastery and started praying in Latin Oh, dear God, this is bad Latin. Cicero wouldn't like this stuff. Now, I was smart enough not to <laughs> tell that to the novice master that I thought this was lousy Latin. <laughs> I'd be the next novice, probably. So my first experience with the Bible was with the New Testament, and it was some of the same, the Greek. This isn't great Greek. I mean, I had been reading Homer before I was 15 in, in school. So in one sense, it, my first impression wasn't, ooh, wow, this is such a marvelous book. At the back of my mind, again, keeping my mouth shut because I'm smart, I said, this isn't great Greek. But, you know, I, <laughs> I wasn't disillusioned by it or anything. It just I wasn't overwhelmed by it either. It, it didn't have a sacral aura when you encountered it. You <laughs> encountered it as a set of documents, which you yeah. said, this is, these are yes. interesting, but not in the way that I've been taught that they're interesting. It, it was marvelous in the way because no, I didn't start immediately say, well, I don't know if this really happened. Uh, I don't know if I should take this. That didn't happen at all. The first thing was getting over and getting used to kind of very, what well, it was, the Koine Greek, of course, was ordinary everyday Greek. There's Every nothing Greek. wrong with it. It was, it was everyday Greek like you'd, you'd speak in the streets. So it, it didn't have that sacral aura that I can't ask any questions. Well, if I can question the, the grammar, 
and question the language, then of course I can question whatever. But it it wasn't any way destructive. It was simply, well, that's the way it is. And this is, of course, the 60s, and other changes are going on as well. Exactly. I mean, I was, I was ordained in 1957, got my doctorate in 59, and then I spent two years in Rome, 59 to 61, and then two years in Jerusalem. So I was having a marvellous education, in seeing the world, in a way. And well. Vatican II is opening the way for Catholics to become engaged in ways they'd never had before. Very much. Remember, I was in Rome, 59 to 61. I came back. There was postdoctoral work. And we knew all the stuff that was going to be discussed at the Vatican <laughs> Council. In fact, some of our teachers who were in uh, severe trouble would later be kind of exonerated by the council. I, would, uh, I had Sarah Wick and Leone and people from the Vatican was looking at with a very jaundiced eye as my teachers at the Biblical Institute. So we came back with our biblical degrees and we thought, this is, this is bliss in this dawn to be alive, as Wordsworth said. And then we, f- we found the whole thing going downhill. The regression set in, the reaction set in. So after 65, instead of this being marvellous, this new church, this vibrant, it was reaction. So by 69, I asked for a dispensation and I left the monastery and the priesthood. There's a, a shutdown there, I, I think, in two ways, perhaps. A shutdown in, the, in that sense of adventure, but mm-hmm. there also is a feeling of, of shutdown in the, in the freedom to explore your discipline. Oh, yes. Uh, the decision to become a professor was never mine. I was a monk. They decided... I mean, I, I don't mean this, I'm complaining in any way. You go into a monastery to do what you're told. So they decided we're going to become a professor. Fine with me. You're going to go to here. You're going to go to there. Fine with me. Now I'm, I'm trained to think and trained to think very well. So my integrity is not that I'm going always to be right. I hope I am. But my integrity is say, this is what I have found. And if you don't like what I have found, I'm sorry, I've still found it. You are free to say you don't like it. But you're not free to tell me I didn't find it. And as I find out, you're not free to tell me not to say it. So that was, there was a discord between being a priest, my obedience as a priest, and my integrity as a scholar. It, lots of other people don't have that clash, but it was for me. Well, as um, somebody who is about to assume the highest honor of the church, John Henry Newman um, mm-hmm. once described conscience first. Yeah, conscience first was very clear. I certainly didn't think I couldn't be wrong or anything. There's nothing to do with that at all. And my, my discord was up in my order. They were very protective. It was really with the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. <laughs> we, had a, we had a dispute, shall we say, and at the end of it, I, I was an ex-priest. <laughs> he was still the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. And thus it is I think I been. won, generally speaking. <laughs> <laughs> You're on Sunday night on ABC Radio Around Australia. Our guest is biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan. John Dominic, let's talk now about uh, the adventure of scholarship and, uh, and the path you trod, which uh, with um, your your book about a uh, Palestinian peasant uh, raised eyebrows around the world, but introduced, I guess, a group of lay people, a wider lay audience who were ready for it, scholarship that had previously been known but largely locked up in the academic closet. And... I'd spent a round number from 1970 to 1990 writing for my colleagues, my professional colleagues. That is, no normal human being ever read, read any of this stuff. And I didn't, and even including the historical Jesus, the life of a Mediterranean Jewish peasant of 91, that was still written primarily for my, my constituency of my professional peers. And the extraordinary thing, I can explain what happened at the was put on the front page of the New York Times along with John Meyer's book on the historical Jesus, which was starting out that year. So in the fall, we had it, it struck um, the Seinfelds of the, of the <laughs> New York Times. is extraordinary. Here we have two Catholics getting interested in the historical Jesus, which is news. They're one a priest, one an ex-priest, both studied at the Biblical Institute, and they're quite different. So Christmas story for 91. And that's what happened to the book. It kind of zoomed into the stratosphere. <laughs> it, it wouldn't have lasted, though, if it hadn't struck a chord. It seems to me that the chord it strikes is linked to that experience earlier in the 60s of, of Vatican II yeah. because you're getting a change not only in Catholic culture but in world culture and lots of people are beginning to, to be interested in their faith in a critical way. Lay, you've got an educated lay generation. You've got the baby boomer yeah. generation. Yeah. So there's, a, there's something about the synchronicity of the moment as well. Yeah. There really was. I mean, you're quite right. It, it, 
no publicity would have done it by itself. It would have been just a, a flash in the pan, as it were. But it made it clear that there was this educated lay people out there who were interested in this and were willing to, to you know, take a rather difficult 500-page book, $30 in the United States, and wrestle with it. I don't know how many finished it, but it made it clear to me there's an audience out there for it, and I started quietly shifting to write for that audience, still doing my own research and everything else, but... Yes, the, the Sunday school stories were no longer satisfying to a generation of young people who still didn't want to give away the idea yeah. of faith, but they actually wanted to take it seriously, not just at a spiritual level, but at, a, at the level at which their brains had been trained to operate. Yeah, because you were dealing with people who are highly trained in all sorts of other areas, but really whose religious training or whose biblical training, now especially in the United States, had really halted around Santa Claus level. It had stopped. They were still saying the same things. You couldn't see any development in their mind with regard to the Bible or anything else. So basically, you're quite right. They wanted to, they felt correctly, there had to be something here that's been around for 2,000 years or 3,000 years. There must be something, but what, what's wrong with it? And in one sense, what was wrong was we had lost the whole historical matrix that made sense of this. This way had been prepared in the United States more than perhaps in any other country, except perhaps Britain. In Britain, you had John Robertson writing Honest to God. In the United States, you'd had the the theological groundwork prepared by people like Tillich and others who were were writing stuff that was seeping into the popular culture. You had the uh, Théâtre de Chardin became the idol of of 60s young people with his idea of the, the sort of unfolding phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Of, the, of the universe. So the, the way is prepared here. You get into it in quite a, a tough way, though. You, you actually come together with a group of other people and say, look, we're ready to actually go a whole yeah. other leap here. And the Jesus seminar, seminar. begins with, uh, with Funk and others. <clears throat> Tell us about that. What, what, what brought that together? Well, first of all, it was Bob Funk was the founder. He asked me to be co-director of it right from the very beginning. We started in 85. And, the one, and it's a seminar. We had we invited anyone who was interested in the areas of the New Testament involving Jesus. We sent out, I don't know, 200 letters to all our colleagues. So but the way you operated as a, a seminar yes. was, I think, perhaps the spark of originality yes. here. And we wanted, the, what we all agreed on is it is not ethically right for us to be doing this discussion in, in, in the scholarship and not letting lay people know what we're doing. I mean, whether you like it or not, here's what we're doing. We're still doing it. We could have run this seminar inside the Society of Biblical Literature and not scared the horses. So we took it out into the street and we said, we're going to do it in public. And then we said, we're going to vote. So we have, if we have 40 people here and we make a decision, we will vote and we will tell you whether it was 40 to zero are 21, you know, barely. So, so This is notice. on any particular biblical area of study. Yes. Um, all your scholars are working hard at it, and you decide, okay, at X date we will come together, and rather than sort of continue the argument, we will just say, no, at this point, wow, we're all going to vote on what we think about this particular issue or fact. Yes, the prelude to that was we presumed, you know, post Gutenberg and everything else, let's not read papers at one another. So let's say the discussion today is going to be, is the Lord's Prayer something that Jesus drilled his disciples in? Now get it right, you know. Or is it a very early summary and an excellent early summary of what he stood for or what he knelt for? We're going to discuss that. At the end of the to prepare for it, everyone will write papers. And at the end of it, you will say, I think this or I think that. And then we're going to vote on it. And the vote, of course, is not to establish truth. It's to establish certainty. If all of us agree, then it's a fairly certain for this group. That's all it means. This group agrees on it. So we won't tell you we said Jesus created it without telling you Jesus created it by 21 <laughs> of us against you know, 29 or whoever was there. We will tell you whether it was unanimous, so we'll give you, and we'll give you the reasons. What strikes me about this is uh, it, there is a remarkable sort of historical uh, precedent here. 
next year is the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. And it strikes me that the Jesus Seminar has an echo of what James did with his scholars in bringing them into their committees to actually work and then submit them to a point and then you would argue and make a decision as a committee on what the basis of this textual translation would be. And you'd have to do it. That's the only way you could do it. Now, I don't know if we have a count. You know, was everyone unanimous on using this word rather than that word, for example? But we were following the model that's used by the people who set up the Greek text of the New Testament, the scholars who come together into a committee. They all have to decide among all of these manuscripts and they grade their certainty, not the manuscript. A, B, C, D, and A means very sure, B, not so sure, C, very unsure, and D, you're on your own. So we took the four, we just made them colours. Let me ask a question that I'll come back to later here. What was the breadth of diversity in the scholarship? Did you have people who were straight uh, archaeologists and and textual uh, historians through to people who were ordained, fully um, committed to the Bible as the word of God in some sense? What was the range of... uh, the criterion to be a fellow was basically that, that you had a doctorate in biblical studies or in, so, in something at least that, that you were schooled in it. We, we did not tell somebody that if a, if a literalist or fundamentalist wanted to come there and defend their position, they could. I mean, they would not be ostracized in any way. They might be voted down. But we, we did have a spectrum. We, we sort of had a left wing and a right wing and a center in it, I suppose. The right wing would tend to... So you really have to persuade me. My my pull would be that if 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 Jesus said blessed are the poor, you really have to persuade me he didn't. To some people who might be on the left wing and say, well, my presumption is he probably didn't. You have to persuade me that he did. Yeah. And people who are more in the middle saying, well, it can go either way for me. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm listening to your arguments. We once asked some people, are there any people in this group who would never vote that Jesus said anything, for sure. Never, anything. And we had two people out of 40 who said, I would never vote because how can you have that certitude? And of course we said, well, this is historical certitude. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's like a jury verdict. We, 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 none of us would say, I am absolutely certain. and not, not. Yes. But two people would never have voted yes <laughs> on anything. So they, that factors into the vote. <laughs> That's that's a that's an argument about a conception of the nature of the process, isn't yeah, it? Which exactly. Is... So we always tried in the books we put out to tell people here was the the subject, here was the reasons we were going one way or the other, and here here was the vote. And during the period, uh, the seminar was was in in the public eyes most yeah. intensely. What was the range that you covered? What Did you limit yourself to a, a range of a period in time or a range of documents? Would just give us an idea of the scope. It was basically, I suppose, the core would have been Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four gospel versions we have. But any, anywhere else where that same uh, saying that we were talking about, say the Gospel of Thomas, where there's independent attestation especially, that was always considered. If it was simply derived from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we paid a little less attention to that. But if if it could be independent testimony, so it really was focused on that. Newfound Gospels, which may have had independent attestation, were also surveyed, or quotations in early church fathers that might be independent were also surveyed. And Paul was incorporated as well to some extent? Yes, where, where Paul seems to be speaking, say, in Romans 12 or 11 or 12 to 13, where he comes very close to talking about loving your enemies, very similar to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. The argument was he seems to be reflecting what Jesus says here, or if he says, as the Lord says. We would definitely have to consider that. So did. James in there as James well. very much. Yeah. And even if, even if James was not saying the Lord said, but he was making a statement about something that echoes something that the Lord says somewhere else, in the, we have to look at that. So it, as James, wide as possible. James actually might be a, a, a useful example because James is one of those books in the Bible that, uh, depending on the fashion and scholarship, has either been... Um, out on the fringes, I look. He, he was commenting later, and you know, didn't quite get it right. Yeah. Or right in the centre, as pre everything else, he yeah. is so cl- he's different because he is so close to Jesus. Yeah, uh, I think G- I would consider uh, James to be quite quite radical. He has the same 
problem that Jesus has between the rich and the poor, and it's not that the rich are bad and the poor are good. It's, it's the biblical horror at the inequality of distribution of God's earth. That's what horrifies the Bible, really. It's not that they're rich people. If everyone was rich, I think the Bible wouldn't care. If everyone was poor, I don't think the Bible would care. I really don't think it would. There's nothing in the Bible when they're wandering across the desert in the Exodus about being poor. It's when you start getting some people have so much and others don't have enough, then the Bible gets horrified. And James is in that tradition. He and Amos could sit down together and agree on everything. So do you put James, uh, for your own part, closer to uh, the time of, of, of Jesus himself or writing at a remove? I tend to not so much focus just on that chronological question, no. but whether I see close continuity between what Jesus the, is saying and what James is saying. The resonance that, is That's important. what I see, very close continuity. Mm -hmm. The importance for me, say, of Paul is not that just that he's writing in the 50s, very 20 years of Jesus, but that Paul's is completely consistent with what Jesus has to say. He's taking Jesus out into the great big Roman world. Mm -hmm. So it's the consistency. There's other texts I see which are trying to um, soften the radicality of Jesus. Uh, for example, Jesus tells people not to carry a staff. So we've got no defensive. You don't even have the basic defensive weapon that keeps the dogs away from you. They're a small-time thief. Well, you can see in Matthew and Luke, they quote that. When the same thing is quoted in Mark, Mark says, carry a staff. I mean, as Jesus said, that's very understandable for me. That, that's like too much. Come on. So I would be quite certain that don't carry comes first. Carry comes second. That's what you'd expect from normal human nature. So it's, it's that type of a change that's more important for me. Let me ask you about one other uh, story, and it's one that a lot of people concentrate on. It's the, it's the nativity stories okay. because they seem so rich in coherent meaning. That is the story of a, an unmarried young lady, yeah. the story of denial at the inn, living with the animals, yeah. the beasts. This seems so theologically powerful coherent yes. and powerful. Yeah. Yet most scholars would say, look, it's, it's written post facto. You, yeah. you, you can't write that story without knowing... The crucifixion, yes, because yeah. it's written about something that nobody was around to see at the yeah. time or would have recognised at the time. The, the the term that Marcus Borg and I use in our book, The First Christmas, is parabolic overtures. They're parables. They're not mistakes. They're not lies. They're not myths. What Matthew has to do, let me take Matthew as an example. Matthew, let us say, has written his book. And like any of us who write a book, we write the overture last. And then we'll say what we're going to do. And lo and behold, we do exactly what we say we're going to do, which we couldn't have done, of course, at the beginning. So now Matthew has written his gospel. He's emphasized that, the, that, that Jesus is the new Moses. Uh, he's got the Sermon on the Mount, which he would have called the, the new law on the new Mount Sinai. So Jesus is the new Moses. Now, says Matthew, I have to write my overture. Okay. Hmm. What do I know about Moses? Well, he was almost killed by that evil Pharaoh guy. Ah. I got an evil guy too, called Herod, and he is an evil guy. So I'm going to say he tried to kill Jesus. So Jesus is a new Moses even in his infancy, and then he'll have to escape. So when I read Matthew, I'm in total admiration of his creativity. He is making up a parable. It's a bad habit <laughs> and, to pick and up he from is, Jesus. he is not writing with any historical intent. That is, he doesn't intend this. No. No. In his context, to be understood. In his context, he knows that Jesus was born. He knows Mary and Jesus, uh, Mary and jo Joseph, excuse me. He knows about Nazareth. He, he has that much. Then he's totally free hmm. not to do anything he wants, but to set up an overture for his gospel. Luke comes along, of course. He's written a different gospel, and he's going to write, naturally, a different overture. Overture, if you're thinking of, say, a musical comedy, and you're writing a melody of the music, that we will now recognize when we're listening to the rest of it, which is written, of course, at the end. So in one sense, Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, are their Gospels in miniature. It's If you think of an ancient manuscript with no chapter headings or, or periods or breaks, this is like something up front to tell you, okay, now, here's what's going on. If you really get this first two, 
verse, verse 2 chapters of Matthew, you'll get the new Moses, you'll be all set, and you'll know what's happening. It's an overture. You're on Sunday night. Our guest is John Dominic Crossan, biblical scholar visiting Australia at the moment, uh, part of a very busy life in retirement. John Dominic Crossan, let's talk about the elements of the story as they've concerned you and the discipline you've set yeah. yourself over the years, and that is to, to, to tease out what we can reasonably know in factual terms about Jesus, who he was and what he believed. So let's take those in, in order. First of all, factually, who was Jesus? Okay. Factually, he came from Nazareth, which is not quite the back of beyond, but close to it. It's a small... I don't know, a hamlet, a cluster of houses on the, on the side of a, of a hill in, in Lower Galilee. But, on the other hand, it's only about four or five miles away from what was the capital of Galilee, Sepphoris, when Jesus was growing up. But about the time Jesus was born, a, an uprising, this is before BCE, an uprising in his homeland brought a legion, 6,000 crack troops, into Sepphoris, and burned it to the ground. Now, when a legion of 6,000 crack troops hit a city, we aren't talking about precision bombing. Every village in the area would have been devastated. If the men were not able to hide, they would have been killed, the women would have been raped, the children would have been enslaved. The legions moved through like locusts, and they moved through not only to put down the rebellion, but to make certain we don't have to come back for two more generations. We're going to teach you people a lesson. So when Jesus is growing up in this tiny village, the Romans aren't mythological beasts beyond the Mediterranean. From my own Irish experience, I cannot imagine that the major subject in Jesus' village growing up Mm. was the day the Romans came and what happened. Now, I hope most of those people were able to escape because there's tunnels and things that people know they know how to hide until the, the legions go past, because they will go past. So I imagine Jesus growing up with an education on what happened, what the Romans do. And I'm sure he'd have to ask himself, well, where was God? What sort of education would he have had as a young Jewish boy in that sort of area? It would not have been anything that you and I might use for education. Of course he would have known his own tradition. He would have known it much the same way as I knew the Christian tradition growing up in Ireland. So there were religious liturgy. schools for young kids? No, they? no, not at all. No, they, nobody could afford that. You can't have, Peasants can't afford to have that type of schools for their children until well into the 19th century. Now, they would know, of course, about the Bible being written, so you would have great respect for the written word, even among an oral tradition. That's very important, that the written word was important. Would he have been familiar with other dialectal languages in the area? For instance, you know, we, people talk about Jesus being is essentially Aramaic. Yeah. But Greek was also widespread in that community. It, it's a difficult question because sometimes when people ask that question, they want to know, well, then, if he really, maybe he said exactly what he says in Greek. Uh, leaving that aside for the moment. I think it might have been like you find in the United States close to the Mexican border that people who speak English would probably not be speaking Spanish as such, but would know a fair number of words, would recognize maybe a few expressions, mightn't be able to spell it and write it properly. But Jesus could have known some Greek, Greek expressions, but that he could speak Greek, I do not think. What was the thrust of the message he eventually began to proclaim? What do you think impelled him and then what was the thrust of it? The thrust of the message, we really have a major consensus in scholars of this. If you want an expression on a postage stamp for Jesus, it's the kingdom of God. And if you think for a moment that kingdom was what the Romans called themselves, they didn't call themselves an empire, they called themselves the kingdom. And since Caesar was divine, they might well have thought, kingdom of God, well, I guess that's us. So what he is talking about is a frontal onslaught on the Roman Empire. Why do we need a kingdom of God? Jesus, we got one already. It's called the Roman Empire. And of course, that's why kingdom is an important word. People sometimes say to me, can't you get rid of that male word, the royal kingdom? Talk about the community of God, the people of God, the, the kinship of God. But kingdom is the key word that will raise Roman eyebrows, prick up Roman ears, and Pilate will be listening. You caught his attention. So, The message has to be that there's a different way that God wants to... 
Let me put it this way. Kingdom of God means what would this world be like if God sat on Caesar's throne? If the Jewish God of Old Testament Torah and prophecy sat on Caesar's throne? Or we might, we might put it, what if God wrote the federal budget? I, that works in the States. I think it would work here as well, okay, in Australia. What if God drew up a budget for the world? What would it look like? That's really what kingdom of God means. It's not about heaven. It really isn't. If it was about heaven, Jesus would have died of old age. Yeah, well, it, it, yes, in a sense, the whole uh, Christian uh, idea of the incarnation is something about the groundedness, isn't it? About the, I mean, the whole theology of the incarnation is about earth matters in some it senses. Is. Yeah. Carne is a Latin word for flesh, so incarnation means enfleshment. And for me, that's why history is important. History is important for me for historical reasons, of course, mm. but also for theological reasons. If you're not interested in history, you can't believe in the incarnation because incarnation happens in a certain time and a place and there's factors that made it possible for a Jesus to be a Jesus within the lull between the two great wars, rebellions of 4 BCE and 66 and in an area where there was a lot of non-violent resistance against Rome not just by Jesus, but by other Jews. His conception is pretty sophisticated in that sense, isn't it? Because he's saying, he is saying, yes, we are at war, but we're not at war. Yeah. It, it very is, and it would make sense to me, because if he's been hearing, as I imagine, I'm imagining this, but I can't not imagine it, that Jesus growing up would have heard about Sepphoris being burned to the ground and enslaved and they'd risen against the Rome. And if he knew his whole tradition, he'd have to ask himself, well, where was God the day the Romans came? I thought he was on our side. Not just what about Rome, but what about God? And what about violence against Rome? Is there any other way th than violence against Rome? What about non-violence against Rome? And we have lots of examples in 6 CE and, and probably 26 under Pilate and again with, with uh, Caligula of massive non-violent resistance. So it's, it's there. Is it the strength of that moral teaching that not only attracts followers and gives them uh, sufficient energy to sustain themselves over three years, but the strength of the moral teaching is exhibited in the way in which his death becomes a key moment? That is, his death and what happens after that isn't relevant to the people at that time, yeah. unless his life has yes. been enormously significant. Yes. And yet we've, we've in the Christian tradition, tend to move away from his life, from the life of the Nazarene. And it would be a disaster. Because if you were, to, if you were just, say, an ordinary person in the first century and you heard there was Jesus who was crucified, you would think, if you knew nothing else, he was either a runaway slave who was caught, or he was a rebel, a violent rebel. That's your immediate thing. If you didn't know the life, to say that Jesus was crucified could be a very dangerous message, say, for Paul to, to mention. So what you're saying is this. One of the things we're really sure about Jesus, historically sure, as certain as anything can be that's historical, is that Jesus was crucified by Pilate. That is legitimately, officially, legally, publicly, which tells us, of course, that he wasn't just an, a nuisance. He was doing something public that required a public demonstration, don't do what this person is doing. By, by both sides of the equation, the theological side and the political side. Yes. He was creating enemies on both sides. On both sides. And th there was not the slightest doubt there was collusion between the high priest, who could be hired and fired, of course. It's not necessary to demonize Caiaphas. The bad administration, and it was bad administration even from the Roman point of view, was that Pilate had to negotiate with the leader of the people he was imperially in control of, whom he could fire. Now, that doesn't happen anywhere else. The governor of, of Asia could not fire the richest man in Ephesus. How could he do that? But he could fire the high priest. So that's a very unequal situation, which is bad even from the Roman point of view. The other point about the crucifixion, and this is crucial, is that Pilate didn't attempt to round up Jesus' followers. So you have to hold on to two things. Jesus was publicly executed, but he didn't round up his followers. When the Romans went after somebody who was a violent revolutionary, you grabbed all you could get your hands on. Mm. Like and it's not as if Jesus' followers weren't there. I mean, oh. Peter was there. You get the accusation of all of those. Instances. If they could have got Jesus, they could have got the others. So 
That tells me very clearly from Pilate. We are dealing with somebody who is a public revolutionary, but he's nonviolent. Because that's the way Antipas took care of John the Baptist. You don't round up his followers. He's the leader of a nonviolent resistance. He's against our Roman law and order. He's a pain in our Roman law and order. But he's not a violent threat. So the way the Romans handled that is we pick off your leader. You're still at it in a few years, pick off your leader again. We keep picking off your leader until you get the message. So Pilate is the greatest witness in the New Testament that Jesus was a nonviolent revolutionary. Both things. Pilate. What's interesting too there is is Pilate is one of the the great sort of historical attestations to the reliability of the story in that Pilate's connection through the governmental structure into the Roman imperial structure. It gives us really concrete ways of identifying certain elements of this story as true and giving a real political bearing on the story which comes from uh, the imperial side, not just from the, the Jesus side. Well, Pilate's mentioned in all the creeds, for example, from the Jesus side. But if we, if we didn't have the New Testament, Pilate is probably the governor we know most about, governor of Palestine we know most about. He's in Philo, the Jewish um, philosopher from Alexandria. He's mentioned in Josephus. And both of them agree. For, for Philo, he's like a poster boy for a bad governor. I mean, you want to say when you read what Philo said, come on, he couldn't have been that bad. He just lays into him as, a, as a, the worst. And what Josephus says about him, before he was removed by Rome, by the way, so was Caiaphas, he says it was especially because of the way he handled unarmed crowds. Unarmed crowds who came to protest, he attacked them, which is interesting when you imagine the New Testament vision of the crowd screaming at Pilate and Pilate doing nothing. That's not the Pilate we know. So we know a lot about Pilate. And you're quite right. He represented, he was there for 10 years, most governors took two years and they wanted to get back to Rome as fast as they could. He was stuck in the boondocks for, and probably hated it and took it out on his people, I suppose. Uh, John Dominic, let's now get to the uh, the contentious bits, the, the, the resurrection uh, narratives, because on this the Jesus Seminar is variously praised or damned yeah. by all sorts involved. One of the key things, of course, is that the starting point for you is what do we know as fact? Yeah. Other things can be yeah. brought to bear later, but what? let's start there. What do we know as fact? I would say two facts that we know. First of all, we know that Jesus had told his disciples and, and demonstrated for his disciples that God's kingdom is already here. Not coming soon, but already here. Now hold on to that. The second thing we know, and I think this is, this is historically certain, is that after his death, those closest to him had visions of him as alive as you and I are right here. You have the Ephesus story, uh, the Emmaus the story, Hose- and you have the all those stories on the water, the, the, the one thing they all agree the on. Beach. That's yes. right. Even the one thing that, that um, Paul agrees in, visions. I, I'm not talking hallucinations. No. I'm talking about Jesus is gone but still here. Now, whether you can touch him or not, in a vision you can do anything you want. So I put these two things together. The kingdom is here. Jesus is killed. And Jesus is appearing to us. Resurrection is an interpretation born of those two facts. Either Jesus was totally wrong, the kingdom is not here, and let's go back to fishing and forget it. Or Jesus was right, and then the resurrection has begun. And the resurrection was, in Jewish thinking, the general resurrection was supposed to be the first cleanup of the world, as it were. So if the kingdom is here, the resurrection has begun. We are now in the resurrection period. And that's exactly Paul's theology. He would tell us Christians, you're supposed to be res- living resurrected lives. Like the infancy or birth narratives, the resurrection narratives have enormous theological potency written into them. I mean, yeah. the, the most obviously discussed one is Mary being the first at the tomb. Yeah. This is counterfactual in terms of the culture of yeah. the time. The, the interesting thing, when you look at those two parallels and you think, say, of the prodigal son or the good Samaritan, both parables, but they have become words that everyone knows, even if they don't know where they came from. So let me take that example. In Mark's Gospel, the woman who anoints Jesus before his death, 
And Jesus says of this woman, what she has done must be told wherever the gospel is told, which is an extraordinary acclamation for you. Wonder, what did she do? She would just be nice and... But it says, she has anointed me for my death. So that means, ha, ah, finally, Jesus has been going up to Jerusalem talking about death and resurrection, death and resurrection, and the disciples have been saying, yeah, yeah, whatever. Now, a woman believes him. This is the first Christian, as it were. She believes what Jesus says. Therefore, she's saying to herself, well, guess I better anoint you now because I'm not going to get a chance. So in Mark's gospel, actually, she is the hero woman, if you will. The woman who go to the tomb in Mark's gospel on Easter Sunday morning, as we say, to anoint Jesus are for Mark the ones who don't get it. You should know he's not going to be there. He told you. So the, the, the great climaxes of Mark's gospel are the unnamed woman who believes and says, I better get the anointing done now, and the unnamed centurion who sees his death and says, these are both parables, of course, this is the Son of God. Now, when you lose your centurions, you've lost your legions. If a centurion, even though it's only one and it's a parabolic story, but this centurion says, a Christian confession, this is the Son of God. I'm not taking this historically. I'm taking it parabolically. Mark is saying the death of Jesus is that Rome hasn't won. Rome is lost. What did those people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, whomever, who wrote those earliest gospel narratives believe about those events? Did they take them literally, for example, or metaphorically? The way be, if you ask that question, say, of a classicist, uh, when the, when people said Caesar was divine, were they speaking literally? They, they usually won't like the question, first of all. And the reason is, in a pre-enlightenment world, we cannot answer that question. It's a post-enlightenment question. We can say this. To say that Caesar was the son of God, divine and savior of the world, and all of that, was taken programmatically, affirmatively, seriously, and it was not smart to go up to Caesar and Augustus and say, you do know, Your Excellency, that you're just a metaphor. That wouldn't be smart. But whether they took it literally or metaphorically, we have no way of knowing because we're asking a post-Enlightenment question to a pre-Enlightenment mind. Some elegant philosophers might say, of course not. This is a way of saying that uh, Rome should be ruling the world. Of course, and we don't take it literally. But most people took it seriously and didn't ask the question in the same way that when I was a child and I, the Stations of the Cross and Veronica wiped the face of Jesus, I didn't say, was that literal or is it metaphorical? I thought, that is what you should do if you met Jesus going to the cross. You should have the courage to help him. Uh, so I, I didn't ask that question. But I got a point from the story, which was terribly vital. So I think that's what we have to say whether it's literal or metaphorical, they would probably say it's real. Then why can Paul make the statement, which seems in, in response to something else that's been said to him, uh, if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain. It's in vain. And I would say it, that's exactly true. I would say the same thing. I would not say I'm talking literally. It's quite possible, for example, for Jesus to make up the story of the Good Samaritan and to say, go and do likewise. Go and live like this. And he's not telling you to cruise up and down the Jerusalem Jericho Road and look for corpses. You're expected to understand that, okay, you're asking me to help even my enemy if I find my enemy in distress. I see what you're saying, Jesus. So a metaphor or a parable can be just as life-challenging as taking a literal story. So I do not think in the ancient world where most people... 99% of people believed wonders and miracles and Caesar going up to heaven could happen. If you said in that world, Jesus is in heaven, and some said, yeah, but Caesar is in heaven, then what you're saying is, what's Caesar doing for you? Uh, okay, he's taking care of the Roman Empire. How's business? Are you as poor as ever? Maybe Jesus will do more for you. The question I ask, and we're running out of time, but the, the, the question that hangs on this, of course, is the way in which the work of the Jesus Seminar and the work of scholars like yourself is received today. That is, some people will say, these people are about hollowing out the faith, about destroying the faith, about 
primitive reductionism. Yeah. That they're just re- reducing it to what can be known and therefore the rest is uh, trash, is verbiage. Yeah. What's your response to that? It really is not true and it's not adequate because what we are trying to do is not to renew Christian faith but in a way to re-old it. I really am saying I, I do want to really change Christian theology. I do want to do that. And if you say, how dare you think you could do that? Who do you think you are? My only justification is I'm not renewing it at all. I think when I put this back into the matrix of the first century, this is what I see happening. I'm trying to understand what did a person in the first century mean was at stake when they said resurrection. And it's not what our post-enlightenment world thinks. And if that's recovered... I, and please tell me if I'm I'm pushing this too far. Mm. I believe in recovering that, there is also the power of renewal. That is, there was something very powerful going on there that deserves to be recovered. Yes, what happened was in the 4th century, the emperor joined us <laughs> and we became the church of the Roman Empire. That means of the Roman Empire. That means they own it, like the navy of the Roman Empire or the army of the Roman Empire. So in one sense, the fight is to get back to a certain tension with the normalcy of imperialism or civilization or violence and to recognize there was from the beginning a tension and that's why many of these people ended up dead. I'm not advocating martyrdom for anyone because a martyr needs a murderer but this is dangerous business. Does the church still hold an important place in in your life And but more importantly is the church still important for the world? That is exactly the question we're asking right now. Uh, I find myself in churches almost almost every Sunday in a different church across the country, sometimes 25, 35 times a year, talking to people about exactly what we're talking here. I would not be doing it unless I was invited. This is not in the parking lot. This is in the church, including sermons. So you're being invited to churches. So the real question is whether the church has has a future beyond a kind of a comfort zone, somewhere like Christmas. You know, you bring out all the decorations once a year and you go back to nostalgic client and then you put them all back and go back to, to normalcy. Is that what it is, an hour on Sunday morning of sort of spiritual vacation away from reality? Or is the church what it was in the first century, a challenge